When it comes to Santa Claus, there is a lot to unpack, especially when it when it comes to the real life story. Who was Saint Nick? And what are the traditions around him? How did we get them? And so I want to start with a simple question. And maybe it's a loaded question. Maybe it's not so simple. But what do people most get wrong about St. Nicholas? Well, he was a real person. And he lived during the 3rd and early 4th century AD. And this was during the Roman persecution time. And he, his parents were wealthy and elderly and died and left him with a lot of money as a young man. And a movement was sweeping through Christianity called pietism, monasticism, where if you really became a Christian, you should give away all your money and then go live in a cave as a hermit <laughs> and just enjoy your personal relationship with Jesus or join a monastery and even take vows of silence. And so Nicholas um, gets saved and he decides he wants to give away all his money, but he, he wants God to get the credit and not him. So he would sneak into town at nighttime and throw money in the window of poor people. Supposedly, it would uh, land in the shoe or stocking that's drying by the fireplace. And he was in the town of Patara, Asia Minor. Uh, today, that's Turkey. And uh, one of the famous stories was a merchant in the town had gone bankrupt. And back then, the creditors would come and not only take your house and lands, they would take your children. This merchant had three daughters. He knew if they were taken, it would be a horrible life for them. And so the father had an idea. He thought if he could hurry up and marry his daughters off, the creditors couldn't take him. Unfortunately, he did not have money for a dowry, which was needed in that area of the world for a legally recognized wedding. Nicholas hears the problem late one night, throws some money in the window. Uh, the, this provides the dowry for the oldest daughter. Big Buzz talk of the town. She gets married, does it for the second daughter. Uh, by the third daughter's turn, the father's expecting it. He runs outside, catches Nicholas, and Nicholas makes him promise not to tell because he wants the credit to go to God and not to him. That was the origin of the tradition of secret gift giving on the anniversary of Nicholas's death, December 6, 343 AD. And the midnight visits from St. Nicholas and the stockings and shoes by the fireplace. And, uh, but the Greeks have lots of stories about him and because uh, he's the most popular Greek Orthodox saint. St. Nicholas is to Greek Orthodox what St. Peter is to Roman Catholics. He's like the founding father of the Greek Orthodox. There are more Greek Orthodox churches named after Nicholas than anybody else. So wow. the story continues where he gives away all his money and he's going to go to the Holy Land and join a monastery of Zion and take vows of silence and you'll ne never hear from him again. Except right before he takes his vows, the Lord tells him somehow not to hide his light under a bushel. So he goes back to Asia Minor, gets off at a big port city called Myra. Today that's Demre, Turkey. And unbeknownst to him, the bishop had died. And the um, story was that uh, one of the church leaders was praying and the Lord told him the first person into church the next morning would be named Nicholas and he was to be their next bishop. Sure enough, Nicholas is the first one in the door. They ask his name and when he tells it to him uh, and they tell him you're supposed to be the bishop, he was not too excited because the <laughs> Roman emperor Diocletian was arresting bishops and killing them. And it was the, the worst persecution in Christian history. Uh, for 10 years, Diocletian would tear down churches and cut out their tongues and boil them alive and burn the scriptures. And so it was sort of like, you be the bishop. No, 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 you, you first. No, no, really. You, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, you can keep that. I don't, I don't need that job. Yeah, you, you're, you know, I would imagine there's a lot of fear and, you know, reluctancy in that. Yeah, and he agrees. He's arrested. He's put in jail. Meanwhile, the emperor Diocletian is struck with an intestinal disease so painful he abdicates the throne on May 1st, 305 AD. And you have to appreciate the uh, poetic humor. By this time, emperors had been declaring themselves a god, with a little g, sprinkling gold dust in their, in their hair and demanding that their image be worshipped. So this was sort of like a god resigning. Uh, the next emperor is Galerius. He continues the persecution. He's struck with an intestinal disease, dies in 311 AD. Now it's a toss-up as to who the next emperor is going to be. Four generals fight it out. Comes down to two, Constantine and Maxentius. Constantine is a general in Britain, which had been a Roman colony since 55 BC with uh, Julius Caesar. And uh, Constantine marches toward uh, Rome, and right before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, 312 AD, Constantine reportedly sees the sign of Christ in the sky. And it's the 
first two Greek letters for the name Christ. So we abbreviate states with two letters. Well, they abbreviated names, the Greeks. And so the first letter in the name Christ, which is the Greek name uh, for the Hebrew name Messiah, um, the ka sounding letter is written as an X, and it's called Kai. And the er sounding letter is called Rho, and it's written as a P. And so you would see this X and P. It's called the Kai Rho. And Constantine puts it on all of his shields and symbols, and he wins. And so, uh, by the way, over the centuries, it got shortened just to the Chi, the X, and that's where you get Xmas. It's so, so X- let me let me ask you something about this because Xmas gets a lot of people worked up, right? There are people who will say it's not Xmas, it's Christmas, right? And you have because they don't have that understanding. But technically, Xmas is still referencing Jesus, right? So. The Chi or the X was called the Christ's cross, or as we say it today, crisscross. So whenever you say crisscross, that's Christ's cross, and that's the Chi. And it's also part of a written oath where you would sign a document at the Christ's cross. Today, that's signed as the X, and it's on the bottom of Valentine's. Uh, the X was to pledge your sincerity to a person uh, before Christ, and then you kiss it to show sincerity. And then cross my heart, swear to tell the truth. What was the cross all about? That's the Christ cross. You're swearing before God that you're going to keep your word. Um, anyway, so um, so Constantine wins the battle. He stops the persecution of Christians. 313 AD, Edict of Milan, Nicholas is let out of jail. Now that he's out of jail, Nicholas preaches against paganism. So nearby was Ephesus, and it had the temple to Diana. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. 127 huge pillars, twice as big as the Parthenon, and temple prostitutes. It was the Las Vegas of the Mediterranean, and the Apostle Paul in Acts 19 preached against Diana worship. Nicholas preaches against Diana worship. So he'd have been a fire and brimstone preacher today. He preached against exposure of unwanted infants. In Rome, the mother would bear the child, lay it at the father's feet. If he picked it up, they kept it. But if the father did not pick it up, thought it was unhealthy or thought they didn't have enough money, the mother would have to put the baby in a basket and set it out in the woods and let it die or put it in front of some old Christian couple's door and knock on the door and run away and the Christian couple would see the baby in the basket. And and so the Christians would collect these orphans and, and raise them. And Nicholas preached against exposure of unwanted infants. And uh, one of the other stories uh, was the uh, Council of Nicaea. So the Arian heresy starts, and a guy named Arius said Jesus was a created being. He was little less than God, and he writes a catchy song, and the Visigoths are immigrants and, and into Rome. They convert to Arianism, and it's splitting not just the church, but the Roman Empire. And Constantine is saying, hey, political fallout, bishops, settle this thing now. And Constantine pays for all the bishops to go to Nicaea, which is really close to Myra, where Nicholas is the bishop. And so the story is that uh, Nicholas attended the Council of Nicaea. They settled it with the Nicene Creed, great creed still being used today. And the tradition is that Nicholas slapped Arius across the face for starting the Arian heresy. So there's all this, you know, fourth century Christian murals on church walls of Nicholas slapping Arius. And so John will say, Nick had a little temper, better watch out if he's coming to town. And, and, and a fire and brimstone, you know, preacher, which, which is interesting. I mean, so you you obviously have looked at this almost probably more than, than anyone else as a historian, and you have a book, the There Really Is a Santa Claus. When you were going through research and as you've over the years looked at this, you know, how much of it is, and, and I'm gonna use this word verifiable because I know it's it's challenging when we're talking about things that have happened this long ago, how much of it is documented in murals and all of that? And how difficult was it to sort of discern the myths versus the, hey, we think th- these details are actually really true things about him? Yeah, it's basically the Greek Orthodox <clears throat> Church history. And now in the uh, third and fourth century, the Roman Emperor Diocletian was uh, destroying church records and confiscating scriptures. And pastors would go to their death because they re- refused to give up the scriptures. But every now and then, somebody would give them up, and they would destroy them. And so it is uh, it is a challenge piecing together the first three centuries history. Uh, but we do have these traditions. Um, some are more believable than others. 
and I share some of those in my book. One is there was a famine in that area, and it being a port city, ships would come from North Africa, that's where the grain was grown, through what is today Turkey on its way to Rome. Nicholas went down to the port, talks the sailors into unloading some grain to feed his people, promising God would bless them. On their return trip, they said the grain that was left had multiplied, like the little widow's meal barrel with the story of Elijah. And then another story the Greeks passed down is there was a storm. Sailors and fishermen could not get back to the dock. Nicholas goes down, prays, the sea becomes calm. And so he's the quote-unquote patron saint of sailors. Um, and then there's a corrupt politician, and he is going to have some soldiers executed to cover up his corruption. Nicholas hears about it, goes down to the execution square, breaks through the crowd, grabs the sword out of the executioner's hand, throws it down, and then in front of everybody, by knowledge from the Holy Spirit, begins to tell what this corrupt governor was doing, and he repents and, and prays for Nicholas to you know, have mercy on him. And So he dies December 6, 343 A.D. Uh, Justinian, the Christian Roman emperor, builds a cathedral, names it after Nicholas. It's destroyed in an earthquake, and he rebuilds it. And then you have um, uh, Vladimir the Great of Russia in 988 A.D. He throws his pagan gods in the Dnieper River, and he decides to uh, embrace Greek Orthodox Christianity, and he adopts Nicholas as the patron saint of Russia. So that's why you have so many churches and czars that were named Nicholas. And, uh, and then the Muslims invade, and they destroy churches and graves. So people forget in the year 846 AD, 11,000 Muslims invaded Rome, Italy, and they trashed the Basilica of St. Peter's, and they trashed the bones of St. Peter and then St. Paul. And so in the year 1087 AD, they're invading into Asia Minor. These Turks, all seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation, were wiped out. Uh, Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, uh, the Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, all gone. And as they're destroying churches, the Christians move the bones of their famous St. Nichols over to a little town in Italy called Bari, B-A-R-I. And there's a cathedral there, a Cathedral Nicola de Bari. And Pope Urban II dedicated it. And you know Pope Urban II because he's the one that goes to the Council of Claremont in 1095 AD and begs these kings to send help to the Greeks. They do. It's called the First Crusade. So we would not have had St. Nicholas traditions in Italy and Western Europe had it not been for the Muslim jihadis conquering uh, the Byzantine Christian Roman Empire. Uh, then uh, St. Francis of Assisi, 1223 AD, said all these gift-giving traditions associated with Nicholas are a distraction. We need to get back to the reason for the season. He invents the nativity scene. So whenever you see Jesus, Mary, Joseph, donkeys in a manger, that goes back to St. Francis of Assisi, 1223 A.D. Then the Reformation, Martin Luther, by this time in 1517, there is a saint's day for every day of the year. Churches are filled full of relics and statues and sepulchers and uh, side altars. And Luther says this is a distraction from Christ. He ends all the saint's days, including the St. Nicholas Day. But the Germans like the gift giving. So Martin Luther moves all the gift giving to December 25th and said all gifts come from the Christ child. And the German pronunciation of Christ child is Chris Kindel, like kindergarten, kinder care, kind means child and Chris means Christ. And over the years, Chris Kindel got pronounced Chris Kringle. So Chris wow. Kringle, Kindle, which was the Christ child, and Martin Luther says all the gifts come from the Christ child. And, um, and then there's the Christmas tree. I don't have time to, uh, for, I don't know if I have time for that, but um, you do, you do. But can I, I want to make <clears throat> one thing that's so interesting to me here, going back to the beginning of the conversation where, you know, where Nicholas is throwing money into people's windows, he's doing it at night. He doesn't want the glory. He wants the glory to go to God, you know, and, and it's such an interesting story. And you look at the Santa Claus we have now, it's very different, right? The, the Santa Claus tradition, all the kids love him. He's sort of getting glorified at Christmas time, which creates some debate in Christian circles, right? Um, and in certain circles about, 
you know, that tradition and what that means. But it is interesting because the the original, you know, the, the truth is that, hey, this is really more of a humble doing this sort of gift giving um, in secret. And there are some elements of that that have carried over to the tradition. But how, I want to talk about the tree next. But how did we get from Nicholas? And I love what you just described about the gift giving into what we have now with Santa Claus. How did that tradition jump happen? The Dutch. So the Dutch pronounced St. Nicholas, Sant Niklaus, or Santa Claus. So Santa Claus is the Dutch pronunciation of St. Nicholas. And they added on something. You know how Catholics will say St. Peter's at the gates of heaven? Well, the, the Dutch took this uh, scripture from the book of Revelation that Jesus will return at the end of the world to judge the living and the dead, riding a white horse. And the saints will come back with him, riding white horses. And St. Nicholas is a saint, so certainly he'll be one of those riding a white horse, but he's so special, he gets to come back once a year for a little mini judgment, a little checkup on the kids, make sure they're on the right track, see who's naughty, see who's nice. And uh, over. so to this day in Holland, they have St. Nicholas coming once a year dressed as a bishop with his mitered hat and his staff, and he's riding a white horse, and he's there for judgment, and he's got his books, and there's pictures of him sitting with the little kids looking at the books. And... Um, over his shoulder is a person named Zvarte Pete, Black Peter, and he's a Moor. He's a, a Muslim. And uh, they tell the kids, if you're good, St. Nicholas will give you a present. If you're naughty, Zvarte Pete will put you in a gunny sack, take you back to Spain, and sell you into Muslim slavery. Because the Muslims controlled Spain for seven centuries and enslaved over a million Europeans. There were whole Catholic orders in Europe called the Trinitarians that would ransom people out of slavery. So often when you tell a little boy that Sinterklaas is coming. So they'd start crying. Um, <laughs> I was doing a call in one time and a guy said, yeah, I was raised in a, a village in uh, Holland. And um, on the night before St. Nicholas visited, all the little boys would go to sleep with pocket knives in their pockets. I said, why is that? He goes, oh, that's wow. a gunny sack in case of RTP took it. And, um, but anyway, over the century, now the Dutch settled New Amsterdam, which became New York. And so it was the first church the Dutch had built in New York was the St. Nicholas Dutch Reformed Church. It went on to become the, the longest co uh, corporate gathering in America in, in this huge church downtown um, in New York. Uh, but then in 1949, they sold it building to Sinclair Oil Company, who tore it down and built a oil building. And the congregation merged with the Dutch Reformed Marble Collegiate Church and Norman Vincent Peale, the pastor there. But um, so the Dutch brought their St. Nicholas traditions to America, and you had a little bit of a morphing take place. So saints come from where? Heaven, the celestial city, the New Jerusalem. Well, that turns into the North Pole. And in uh, Norway, they didn't have horses, so he's riding a reindeer. And then the Lamb's Book of Life and the Book of Works turns into the Book of the Naughty and the Nice, and the angels turn into elves. And, and it was Washington Irving in New York, 1809, he wrote Dietrich Knickerbocker's History of New York, and he changes his clothes. So he describes St. Nicholas, still calls him St. Nicholas, but he's no longer wearing a bishop's outfit. He's wearing a Dutch outfit, long trunk, hose, leather belt, stocking hat. And then in New York, you have Clement Moore. And there's a park in New York called the Clement Moore Park. And, and so he writes a story in 1823 for his children. He's a Hebrew professor at the Episcopal Seminary. That the story is called A Visit from St. Nicholas. And we, most of us have it memorized. It was night for Christmas, all through the house. Dr. Creature was staring that. Even a mouth, the stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas would soon be there. But now he shrunk. He's a right jolly, plump old elf. And I laughed when I saw him and saw by to myself. And, but then we fast forward to the Civil War. And there's Harper's Weekly Magazine illustrator Thomas Nast, N A S T. You know him because he invented the Republican elephant and the Democrat mule. And Thomas Nast did a harp cover of the Harper's Weekly magazine of St. Nicholas visiting the Union troops. And in the background, there's a North Pole sign. It was a political cartoon to a jab at the Confederate South that St. Nicholas is now associated with the North. But then we fast forward to Coca-Cola. In 1930, they hire Haddon Sunblum, an artist, famous for the Quaker Oats Man and Aunt Jemima Syrup. And he does a painting of St. Nicholas drinking Coke every year for the next 30 years. And Coca-Cola 
pioneered mass marketing. It's the most well-known trademark name in the world. And uh, there's the St. Nicholas has now grown. He's full size again, rosy cheeks, runny complexion, a nice huggable grandfather look. Um, uh, and that's the image that spread around the world. But there really was, when we peel back all the layers, there really was a guy that lived in the fourth century over there in Asia Minor. Today, that's in around Greece, who uh, loved Jesus so much that he gave away his money. He became a, a minister. Uh, he was in prison for his Christian faith. He gets out, he preaches against, um, he would, he'd be a pro-life preacher today. Uh, he preaches against sexual immorality and Diana worship, and he stands up for the Trinity, and he was generous, and he gave to the poor. And so we can remember his generosity uh, and his Christian faith. Um, if we want to skip some of the other stuff, there really was a guy that we uh, can respect for his faith like we respect Peter and Paul. Well, and I think no matter where people are on the Santa debate, some families do it, some families don't, you know, when the time comes or at the start of your journey with children, being able to explain these things that you've broken down of who this person was and why he matters and really what you've described is a person that every Christian should aspire to be like, right? I mean, he's a, he's a great example of what it means to live the Christian life out based on what we know of him. And so it's it's very interesting to hear that history um, but, but before we go, you brought up the Christmas tree and I know you and I could spend three hours talking about this stuff because there's so much here, but the Christmas tree is another one of those interesting symbols that we do it every year. We all love doing it, but where did it come from? What does it mean? And why do we do it? Well, um, I explain all these in my book. It's called, there really is a Santa Claus mm -hmm. the history of St. Nicholas and Christmas holiday traditions. And I can give a plug or websites, AmericanMinute.com, but St. Boniface. So we're familiar with a guy from Britain named Patrick, who in the fifth century went to Ireland and evangelized these pagan Druids, um, baptized 100,000 of them, started 300 churches named St. Patrick, and he used the three-leaf clover to teach these illiterate Druids the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, in the 700s, a guy from Britain named St. Boniface evangelizes these Germanic hordes that had overrun the Roman Empire on the, the eastern side, and they worship Thor. And that's where you get the word Thor's Day or Thursday. And that's why the Quakers would not say Thursday. They would say Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, fifth day, and then uh, Friday, Saturday. Uh, but they refused to say Thor's Day because it was a pagan god name. Well, uh, Thor lived in an oak tree, in Geismar, Germany, and near Fritzlar today, and St. Boniface, also called Winfred, uh, goes through the woods, gets there, pulls out his axe, and chops down Thor's tree, this big oak tree. And somebody says, well, stop him. And somebody else said, well, if Thor's really a god, he can certainly protect his own tree. So in Fritzlar, Germany, they have a bronze statue in the middle of town of St. Boniface with his axe standing on a stump of a big oak tree and and his other hand, he's holding up a little church because he brought the, the gospel. So St. Boniface points to an evergreen tree and says, let this be the tree of the Christ child. Uh, it's evergreen, symbolizing everlasting life. It points toward heaven, and your houses are built of fir or, or cedar, uh, and that um, uh, it is in the shape of a triangle. So it was what he used to teach the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And so the the... Christmas tree was symbolic of the Germans converting to Christianity, similar to the three-leaf clover, similar uh, to represent the Irish converting to Christianity. It was Martin Luther that, that was coming home one night, saw lights in the windows, most likely of Jews with their menorahs celebrating Hanukkah. And Martin Luther comes home and puts candles in the branches of the tree and tells his children, this is like the sky above Bethlehem on the night of Christ's birth. Mm. And, you know, here we are. It's so interesting because a lot of Christmas in America is very secularized, right? But yet all of the things that are being done, they have such a significance that goes back to, if not Jesus himself, traditions around saints and those who who followed him in, in the early church era and the first few centuries and even beyond. I mean, it, it's really pretty incredible when you break it all down. And as you said, you have all of this in your book. The book, again, is 
there really is a Santa Claus and uh, just a fascinating look at all of our holiday traditions as we celebrate this season. I appreciate you taking the time and coming on today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one last trivia. Um, they couldn't decide which day was holier. Western Europe, December 25th, Christmas. Eastern Europe, January 6th, Epiphany, when the three wise men visited. And so at the Consul of Tours in 567 AD, they decided to make all 12 days from December 25th to January 6th, the 12 days of Christmas. And they called them holy days. And over the centuries, holy days got pronounced holiday. So when they say, don't say Merry Christmas, say Happy Holidays. Well, holiday means holy day. And what are the holy days but the 12 days of Christmas? So you can't get away from it. So so now one last question, because you raised that. And I have to ask, even though we were concluding, I've got to pull back here and say, you know, one of the one of the criticisms of December 25th, one of the issues is that, oh, this is, you know, a pagan holiday that was co-opted by the church, um, Santeria or whatever. Santa, I, I forget the name of the holiday. But but talk about that a little bit. Right. So they say that. It was Saturnalia, this Roman Saturnalia. Winter, winter solstice. But Saturnalia is December 17th through the December 22nd. December 22nd is the shortest day of the year. The um, ancient calendars were lunar based and, um, and, and uh, around. And so, you know, the um, idea was that uh, the Roman calendar was solar based. And so the sun was uh, its furthest away from the earth at December 22nd. And then on the opposite of the elliptical orbit, um, excuse me, the, the earth is away from the sun. Um, uh, you have the, the summer solstice on June 22nd. So June 22nd is the longest day. December 22nd is the shortest day. Uh, if they were going to pick a date to overlap Saturnalia, they would have picked December 22nd. Uh, also, uh, it was not until 26, 274 AD, 274 AD, that Roman Emperor Aurelian picked December 25th as Sol Invictus, which Sol means sun, and that was the date they worshiped the sun god. But it, the Christians uh, have documented, there's a St. Hippolytus of Rome in 200 AD who says December 25th is the birthday of Christmas. So it actually could be the flip. It could be that Christmas was December 25th, and the Roman Emperor Aurelian picked December 25th uh, <laughs> A century later to try to overlap the Christians because they were converting. Um, one of the uh, people, they say, well, the sheep are in the field and that had to be, you know, in the springtime. It's like sheep are in the field all year round because they needed uh, sacrifices for the daily sacrifice. And the, the temperature of Jerusalem and Bethlehem, which is six miles away, is like Flagstaff, Arizona. It gets like into the 40s at night and up into the 50s and 60s during the daytime. So it's, it's not a cold place. And uh, but then you get to the scriptures. Uh, we have a clue. It's in Luke chapter one, and it says Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was in the temple doing his ministry during the course of Abijah. It's like what's this course of Abijah? King David divided the Levites into twenty-four courses or groups, and each one took two weeks a year, six months apart, to do their course or their service in the temple. And we know that when the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, the first course was on duty, Jehoiarib. And so if the first course, Jehoiarib, was on duty uh, in the first week of August when the Temple was destroyed uh, through Jewish records, Josephus, the Jerusalem Talmud, then the eighth course, Abijah course, that would be the last week of September. And so the last week of September, Zechariah goes home, Elizabeth gets pregnant. And so the Greek Orthodox Church celebrates September 23rd as the conception of John the Baptist. And so if John the Baptist gets conceived the last week of September, the scriptures in Luke says that when his wife Elizabeth is in her sixth month is when the angel appeared to Mary. Well, six months after the last week of September is the last week of March. And so March 25th is the traditional date that Jesus was conceived. And, and all the early church, even St. Augustine, the famous St. Augustine, said that March 25th was the date that Jesus was conceived. Well, nine months after March 25th is December 25th. And so wow. that's a scriptural way to come up with the December 25th date. Wow. That is that, you know, you, you just are able to pull all these pieces together in such a compelling way. And I appreciate you joining us and breaking down so many of these traditions today. Again, the book is there really is a Santa Claus. Thanks for your time. 
David, thank you. It's uh, always a pleasure to be on with you. And, and if anyone wants to contact me, yeah, AmericanMinute.com.